starting to the cloud. So it's, we are on the record buttons on and we're starting to get participants coming in. Morning, Susan and everyone else. I think it's 1030 and we have a, a, a good number of leftover questions from last week and the week before that, that we want to honor by allowing them to be posed today. So I'll start for uh, Hugh. Stephen Posta says that research has shown that gold, platinum, and uranium are produced by the rapid process, our process, of neutron capturing that occurs when two neutron stars collide. Within a fraction of a second, the R process ejects 10 million Earth masses worth of neutron rich matter into interstellar space. And these elements seed gas clouds that ultimately form stars and planets with those elements in them. I'm confused as to when and how these elements go from gases in the cloud into solid material embedded in planets. Could you please help explain that? Right. And uh, a few years ago, uh, astronomers thought that all of our R process elements, and just to make a distinction here, uh, we have S process and R process for slow and rapid uh, neutron capture. And that refers to the elements in the periodic table that are heavier than iron. And roughly half of those heavier than iron elements, what we call R process elements, elements that are produced by very rapid neutron capture. And astronomers used to think that all the R process elements uh, came from really big uh, stars that underwent a supernova eruption. Uh, thanks to the LIGO instrument, the uh, gravity wave detector, uh, detecting the mergers of black holes. And now they've detected a couple of mergers of two neutron stars. Uh, we now know that the vast majority of our process elements uh, come from the merging of two neutron stars. And uh, yes, you get this gas that comes out. Uh, and uh, it's so hot uh, that it ionizes all the R process elements. But once it gets uh, a certain distance away from the merger event, it cools down and becomes solid. And so, for example, uh, you know, platinum, gold, uranium, thorium, uh, these are our process elements, and uh, they're quite abundant on the Earth. Uh, the Earth is super abundant, especially in uranium and thorium, uh, which means that the solar nebula must have had the experience of being relatively close to a neutron star uh, merging event. We don't want to be close to one of those right now, but at uh, the origin of the solar system, uh, that would be a feature that would explain why uh, we're so super endowed, particularly in uranium and thorium. Uh, but we also have evidence that a lot of the gold and platinum group metals that we see in the crust of the earth, as opposed to the interior of the earth, uh, were salted as a result of an asteroid uh, colliding uh, with the earth, uh, particularly one that collided uh, in South Africa, uh, not far from Johannesburg. Uh, that's where a lot of our platinum group uh, metals actually come from. And uh, astronomers actually know of an asteroid, the asteroid belt, uh, that is uh, very rich in platinum group metals, uh, so rich that uh, uh, it's been valued in the quadrillions of dollars. And there's actually uh, people thinking about, gee, couldn't we go out and grab that asteroid, bring it into a lunar orbit, and mine it and get all those valuable elements? Uh, but that again is evidence that the solar system uh, had to have formed a relatively close to a neutron star uh, merging. And as a follow-up, I'll be happy to take it. Uh, I've written two articles on our process elements uh, that you'll find at uh, reasons.org. If you just put under the search engine, our process elements, they should pop up. It's in my today's new reason to believe uh, archive. Thank you. Steve Zopfi asks, why do atheists disagree that star formation is currently going on? Well, most of the people who uh, reject the idea of ongoing star formation uh, are young earth creationists, uh, but there are a few atheists uh, that join them and uh, basically making relatively the same points that the young earth creationists are making uh, that you know, an isolated gas cloud uh, cannot form a star. And therefore there had to be, you know, really special conditions in the early universe. And that's when stars formed. 
but the problem is we see lots of evidence of ongoing star formation, as you'll note. And uh, I think it was like three and four weeks ago, uh, that was a feature of the scientific discovery was uh, ongoing uh, star formation. So, but yeah, there's not many atheists who deny it, but there are a few. And uh, there are a few because they're trying to posit a model uh, for the universe uh, that's not Big Bang. And so if you're trying to come up with a uh, non-Big Bang model for the universe, it's got to be, uh, the, the history of the universe has got to be quite different than uh, what we think we're observing through our telescopes. Thank you. Timothy Van Nasdale asks, are there discoveries that will come from our improved ability to image black holes that may impact the dialogue about creationism and naturalism? I really believe so. In fact, uh, I covered that in the fourth edition of the Crater in the Cosmos, and you'll find a couple of articles on my Today's New Reason to Believe blog at reasons.org uh, that, that uh, describe our uh, first ever attempt to be able to image the event horizon of a black hole that was done for the really big uh, supermassive black hole in uh, M87. Uh, the active galaxy in the center of the Virgo cluster. Um, and uh, can, can you review the question again, Mark? Are there discoveries that will come from our improved ability to image black holes that may impact the dialogue about creation? Right, right. Okay. I mean, only in the last year and a half have we had the capability of even imaging the event horizon uh, of a black hole. Uh, we're now coming up with superior instrumentation that should be able to give us uh, more precise maps of the event horizons of uh, supermassive black holes. And uh, there's a lot of hope that we can get a really detailed one of the uh, black holes at the center of our galaxy, and likewise the one that's at the center of the Andromeda galaxy. And uh, what goes on just outside the event horizon of a big black hole actually gives you information of what's happening inside the black hole. And I've written in the Crater in the Cosmos, fourth edition, that actually gives you information about the physics of what's called the quantum gravity era. The quantum gravity era, era is really the wrong word. We're talking about the first 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the cosmic creation event. But that describes a time in the very early history of the universe uh, when quantum mechanics effects on the dynamics of the universe becomes comparable to the effects of gravity. And so they refer to this as the quantum gravity era where we can't just assume uh, that gravity is a dominant feature governing the dynamics of the universe. And this has been a fruitful area of speculation by uh, atheist astronomers and physicists because they're basically saying Maybe there's such strained quantum mechanical effects going on in the quantum gravity era that we're not able to see and measure. And so they speculate, for example, that the quantum space-time fluctuations uh, would be quite large in the quantum gravity era. So large, in fact, uh, that would allow for a loophole around the space-time theorems, uh, which prove that there must be a causal agent beyond space and time uh, that created everything. Uh, but what goes on outside uh, the event horizon of black holes actually allows you to put constraints on these quantum gravity speculations. Right now, we don't have accurate enough measurements to put those kinds of constraints on it. What I did mention in the Crater in the Cosmos and also these two web articles, we do have constraints uh, from the images of distant quasars and blazars uh, because of the quantum space-time fluctuations are large in the quantum gravity era, uh, that would actually cause the images of distant quasars and blazars, especially at short wavelengths, to blur instead of being sharp if the quantum space-time fluctuations are small. The principle is that uh, the quantum space-time fluctuations in the quantum gravity era actually get magnified as light travels from a distant quasar or blazar towards our telescope. And so if those quantum space-time fluctuations are large, uh, those images should get blurrier and blurrier as light travels a greater and greater distance and get blurrier and blurrier uh, in proportion to how short the wavelength is. 
Uh, and the test has been done on a quasar that's 3 billion light years away at ultraviolet wavelengths. And there we see uh, crystal clear, sharp images. We don't see any blurring, uh, which it puts a constraint on these uh, speculations that are from atheists. And basically it's affirming that the more we learn about the quantum gravity era, uh, the more evidence we're getting uh, for the biblical cosmic creation model. Uh, it's putting constraints on those uh, space-time fluctuations. They don't eliminate all the atheist speculations about the quantum gravity era, but they have eliminated an entire family of uh, speculations. And as I mentioned, the Creator in the Cosmos 4th edition, we're never going to get to the point where we can eliminate all the speculations. There's always parts of ignorance about the universe that we'll have. And atheists will always be able to go uh, to that little tiny corner in the room where they say, well, we don't have measurements, we don't have observations, maybe things are just super strange there. And, uh, you know, I have a chapter in the Creator in the Cosmos 4th edition uh, talking about non-empirical speculations where people speculate where they have no measurements, no experiments, no science. Uh, but what is interesting is that as we learn more and more about the universe and the quantum gravity era, uh, we're actually pushing uh, the atheist speculations into a smaller and smaller corner of the room. And that should tell the atheist something, uh, namely that, hey, uh, the fact that we're being squished into a smaller and smaller corner of speculation uh, is a strong indication uh, that our atheistic worldview beliefs are incorrect. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Creech Thierry. He says, Cain worried that he was, be in Genesis 4, Cain worries he'll be killed by someone. The Bible doesn't say he was the firstborn of Adam and Eve. Who would Cain be afraid of? Well, so and, yeah, good point. Uh, he would have people to be afraid of because it tells us in Genesis 5, the first five verses, that Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters besides Cain, Abel, and Seth. And, uh, you know, uh, we know that Adam lived to be 930 years. Uh, we don't know how long Eve lived, but we presume that she also had the potential to live that long. And, uh, you know, uh, what we notice with humans today is that they're reproductive for about uh, two thirds of their lifespan or half of their lifespan. And if that were the case for Adam and Eve and all the other people that were living eight or 900 years in the days before the flood, uh, you're looking uh, at about 120 minimum, more likely 200 children uh, per couple. Um, so you get a rather rapid population explosion uh, if, the, if murder is not out of control. And uh, from what we read in Genesis chapter four, it took a few generations uh, for murder to become a significant problem. And uh, I have a table in Navigating Genesis, my book, Navigating Genesis, which shows you how rapidly the human population would rise. Keep in mind, uh, the best birth control method available to humans at that time was the rhythm method without the benefit of thermometers. And uh, we know from present day experiments, uh, at best, uh, couples are going to be able to limit uh, the reproductive uh, capability to about one child uh, every three years. Uh, so you're going to get a lot of children and you're going to get a rapid growth of population. In fact, I demonstrate in Navigating Genesis, conservatively, if people were not murdering one another, uh, you'd have 17 billion people upon the face of the earth uh, before Adam reaches 760 years. So if... Uh, we don't know exactly when uh, Cain murdered his brother Abel, uh, but he wouldn't have to wait very long before he would have several women to choose from to marry and several people around to help him build his city and populate his city. Uh, and the stats are given there in Navigating Genesis. The one caveat is we do know that murder did get out of control uh, several generations of past uh, Abel. It tells us that in Genesis chapter four, Tubal Cain, for example. Great. Christine Murphy asks, how do we reconcile the Babylonian Gilgamesh flood story being written before the Bible story and the fact that the Jews were exiled to Babylon and could have heard that story? Yeah, good question. Um, 
Hebrew did not become a written language until the 15th century. Uh, some scholars think they didn't become a written language until the 12th or 13th century, uh, but I'm of the opinion it did become a written language uh, by the 15th century. And, uh, and because the Gilgamesh epic uh, predates the 15th century in written form, uh, then we shouldn't be at all be surprised that the flood occurred, say, sometime during the Ice Age, that the earliest written records uh, that humans had uh, would say something about the flood of Noah. And we shouldn't be surprised that there are significant distortions relative to the account in the Bible. You say, well, how did it get preserved until uh, the real story, the true story, get preserved uh, until Hebrew became a written language? Uh, likely, it was uh, preserved orally. And uh, if you go into cultures that don't have a written language, they are quite capable of preserving the important things in their culture by elders teaching their children and grandchildren to memorize those important uh, aspects word for word. And they test them on it to make sure they got it correctly memorized uh, word for word. And, uh, you know, those cultures that don't have a written language, their capability of doing word for word memorization is utterly amazing, amazing to us who have a written language. I mean, I'm old enough that uh, when I went through the public education system in Canada, they had us memorize thousands of lines of uh, Shakespeare's plays and we'd have them memorized word for word and we'd be tested on it. Likewise, I had us memorize thousands of lines of British poetry. Uh, so, uh, but today, of course, uh, I can't recall those because I've got the works of William Shakespeare right here in my uh, bookshelf here. So if I ever want to know what William Shakespeare's play say, just pull the book off. No need for me to store it up here. But I tell you, if I didn't have the written record of Shakespeare's plays, uh, then likely I would have retained that word for word uh, memorization. Now, what you'll see in Navigating Genesis, I have a chapter where I compare the Gilgamesh epic side by side with a biblical account. And it's quite apparent uh, the differences. There are some similarities, uh, but there are way more differences than there are similarities. And only the biblical account is scientifically credible. We look at the Gilgamesh epic, uh, the boat that's described there would not be seaworthy. It wouldn't be capable of keeping people alive and their animals uh, for a significant period of time. Uh, and also you notice uh, is loaded with a political agenda. Uh, it's basically a, uh, an epic uh, poem uh, that's motivating uh, the peoples that are there to say, hey, okay, there's the nobility and then there's the rest of us and we've got to know our place. And there's not a hint of that in the biblical text. Uh, so and it, consistent with the biblical doctrine that God treats all of us humans uh, equal in terms of status before him. Okay, Hugh, it's uh, about 20 minutes before your time to leave. What would you like to do? Continue with questions or how do you want to proceed? Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, I'll uh, stop the Q&A at this point because I, I do want to make some progress on our Bible lesson uh, before I have to exit. Uh, I didn't know this last week, but uh, the event I'm doing in Alabama was two consecutive Sundays. So I'll be transferring over uh, to you, Mark, and uh, to Jamie and Ross. Uh, what I have to leave uh, somewhere between 11.10 and 11.15 and uh, do my event in uh, Alabama. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, uh, share a screen now so that uh, we can actually make some progress on our dual revelation series that we're doing. So let me do that right now. And you can remind me when I get a little bit past 11.10. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm having an issue sharing. Okay, now I'm, it's like I had to. Okay, this should work. It was questioning me whether I had the authority to share a screen, but I think I'm good. Okay, all of you should be seeing my first slide. It's the first slide I show away. Let me get rid of this.
Okay, I got to exit again. Get rid of this panel here. Okay. And let me go back. Ah, it says I am screen sharing. Good. Okay. Okay, here's the first slide. As a slide I show every week, just letting you know if you don't get a chance to ask your questions, I do take questions on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, yes, you're all welcome to subscribe to the Reasons to Believe YouTube channel. Uh, it's free to subscribe and they'll alert you to all the new video clips we're, we're placing there. Uh, so with that, uh, let me, yeah, uh, we're doing dual revelation. A lot of what we're talking about is covered in this book that I wrote more than a theory. You can get a free chapter at uh, reasons.org and a really fun, uh, uh, you know, docudrama that we produced uh, many years ago on Dual Revelation. It's a DVD you can get at the store at uh, reasons.org. Uh, now, uh, I had prepared, I wasn't aware I was going to have to go to do this Alabama event today. So I actually prepared uh, um, a discussion of a new scientific discovery. I'm just going to skip through all these slides about the fine structure concept and how it gives us stronger evidence for the biblical creation model and get right into our due revelation series. Next week, uh, I'm, I'm going to have the full time with all of you and uh, I'll uh, uh, go through that uh, scientific discovery. It's an amazing discovery that's actually giving us a lot more evidence for the biblical account of creation and also telling us things about uh, dark matter that we never knew before. And I think eventually it's going to lead also to uh, a much stronger uh, evidence case uh, for the biblical uh, creation model. Okay, dual revelation. Yeah, Reasons to Believe was actually founded on the two books doctrine uh, back 36 years ago. And I tell people what we do at Reasons to Believe, we use God's book of nature, how God reveals himself through two books, the book of nature and the book of scripture. And we use the book of nature, the latest discoveries being made in the book of nature to bring people to the book of scripture and bring them into a relationship with the creator of the universe and the one who has inspired uh, the words of the Bible. And uh, this book, uh, Creation, Evolution, and Intelligent Design, it's called Four Views on Creation, Evolution, and Intelligent Design, actually gets into the different models uh, within Christendom on uh, how we are to integrate uh, God's book of nature with the book of scripture. Uh, this book was authored by the four presidents of the largest science faith organizations. Uh, the largest such organization is uh, Answers in Genesis. The president is Ken Ham. So uh, he contributes uh, a chapter in this book. I contribute a chapter. Uh, Deborah Harzma, the president of BioLogos, contributes one. And likewise, Steve Meyer of the Discovery Institute. Each of us lays out our case in about 10,000 words. And uh, then uh, each of us has an opportunity to respond uh, to the critiques that we get from the other three authors of the book. And then we also have an opportunity to give a very short response uh, to the three critiques uh, that we get. But what I find interesting about this book is that all four authors have very different positions on uh, the two books, the book of nature and the book of scripture. All four authors also have a, a very different view uh, on a very different view uh, on uh, biblical inerrancy. Interestingly, they all believe in biblical inerrancy. They all say they believe in the two books doctrine, but they have radically different definitions of uh, what biblical inerrancy means and uh, what um, uh, the two books doctrine is all about. And I'll give you a little tip. I'm the only one of the four authors that actually endorses the two books doctrine, the way it's outlined in the Belgic Confession which we'll be discussing uh, in this uh, series. And I was also the only author uh, that endorsed uh, all the affirmations and denials of the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy. This book, Old Earth or Evolutionary Creation, is a two views book, not a four views book. 
and it's actually a dialogue between the scholars at Reasons to Believe and the scholars of BioLogos, uh, where our dialogue was moderated uh, by uh, Southern Baptist theologians. And, uh, and it's, it's a longer book and uh, actually gives you a more detailed uh, dialogue or description of the distinct views uh, between uh, old earth creationists and uh, uh, evolutionary creationists uh, that are at the BioLogos uh, Institute there. Okay, what I'm going to do now is uh, actually define different science faith models. And uh, here I'm going to look at the way not only Christians uh, look at the two books, uh, but the way that uh, non-Christians uh, look at the two books. And I'll also kind of give you an idea who are the main proponents of these different views. And so uh, there are four uh, ca classifications of models. There are many more than four models, uh, but they all fall into these four categories. Uh, the conflict model, the separate magisterium model, uh, the complementary model, and then the constructive integration model. And so I'm going to go into each of these uh, separately, give you the definition for each one, and uh, then uh, we'll begin to look at it. And uh, I'm labeled number four, constructive integration. Uh, that's uh, different organizations and individuals who believe uh, that the scientific record and the Christian faith can be fully, literally, and consistently integrated. Uh, the first three positions would depart from that in different ways. So we'll get into the uh, conflict uh, model first. And uh, this is the idea that there's a war uh, between uh, those who uh, look at the book of nature for revelation and those who look at the Bible for revelation. Probably the two most famous proponents of this conflict model uh, would be the British biologist and atheist Richard Dawkins. And, and then the president of Answers in Genesis, Ken Ham. Uh, but every leader of a young earth creationist organization, and I've debated uh, nearly all of them, uh, is that they all hold to some kind of conflict model. So all the presidents and vice presidents of the uh, different young earth creationist organizations, just like Richard Dawkins, will fall into a conflict model, only they believe uh, that the Bible is going to trump uh, science and uh, vanquish science and leave the Bible alone as the trustworthy uh, revelation uh, from God. So, and then we'll get into the uh, separate uh, magisterium model. And incidentally, when you read uh, the writings of Ken Ham, for example, or Henry Morris, uh, the past leader of uh, Institute for Creation Research, or Richard Dawkins, uh, or people like Lawrence Krauss. Um, I'm thinking of the, the, the biologist at the University of Chicago. I uh, can't think of his name. I did debate him up in Alaska years ago. Uh, they use language uh, that uh, is highly charged and uh, basically uh, referring to people who hold to the other view as being incompetent, uh, as being uh, you know, liars or arrogant. And uh, so there's a lot of name calling going on in this uh, conflict model. And this actually angered an atheist, uh, J. Stephen Gould, Stephen J. Gould, uh, the biologist, he's passed away, uh, but he wrote voluminously on this subject uh, while he was alive. Uh, you know, he loved to write thousand page long books. And it was uh, Stephen J. Gould who basically came up in a very famous essay uh, with this separate magisteria model. And uh, he was uh, concerned that there was this battle going on uh, between Bible-believing Christians and then uh, research scientists uh, studying the scientific record. And his response is, you know, this, this battle is needless. We don't need this battle. We simply need to realize uh, that science is dealing with a completely different subject matter uh, than what the Bible is dealing with. And basically his point was, you know, science is a discipline where we look at the world and we establish facts, we establish what's true, we establish what's non-true. Uh, the Bible is a book that really looks at uh, faith issues 
how we should treat one another, uh, morality. It deals with our emotions, uh, how we should, uh, you know, express ourselves uh, to one another. And uh, because uh, the Bible and science deal with completely different subject matter, uh, there's no need for a battle, no need for a conflict. We just need to have the religious people stick with their Bible, stay away from science. Likewise, to have the scientists stick with their science and stay away from the Bible. Uh, simply, we need to agree not to dialogue with one another on the subjects that are outside of our uh, magisteria. However, uh, Stephen uh, J. Gould, in an attempt to bring peace uh, to this uh, conflict model, actually made the conflict worse in the sense that people and reading what he wrote basically said, okay, what he's really saying is we scientists deal with facts. We deal with what's true. We determine what is false. Uh, people looking at the Bible, uh, they're all about feelings and uh, they're all about emotions and it's not a book about facts. And so it got the idea, okay, what Stephen Jay Gould is just saying is the Bible is all about uh, feelings. It's all about, uh, you know, how we should be treating one another. Uh, it's all about, uh, quote, wishful thinking, as opposed to that which is actually true and what can be established to be true or false. So it actually fired the fuels of the conflict uh, people rather than trying to uh, calm them down. And uh, then you have a third model, which is uh, the complementary model uh, where, and this is uh, popular with uh, theistic evolutionists and evolutionary creationists, where they reject the separate magisteria model. However, they're very careful not to have a lot of overlap between what was being revealed in the book of nature and what is being revealed in the book of scripture. And so as it's displayed it there, it's like the two revelations are barely touching one another. Uh, you see this, for example, and then the books put out by John Walton and the Tremper Longman, others of Biologos and uh, amongst the theistic evolutionists, which basically say we need to realize the Bible says very little at all about science. So for example, I think I got one of John Walton's books here behind me. Uh, let me see if I can pick it out here. No, I won't take the time to try to find it, uh, but uh, he's written the book about uh, the Lost World of Genesis 1. He's got a whole series of Lost World books. And basically he says, well, the Bible does talk about the beginning of the universe and the universe was created by God, but that's about as much as it actually says uh, about uh, scientific issues. And how he deals with the conflicts, apparent conflicts between what Genesis teaches and what science teaches, he says, we just need to understand uh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are not about history. They're not about science. It's basically making theological points. It's all about the function of creation uh, rather than the operation or the order of creation. And so he basically, and you know, Tremper Longman, for example, has written a really lengthy uh, commentary on uh, the book of Job and basically begins that commentary by saying, there is no scientific content in the, the book of Job and therefore uh, sidesteps all these issues of apparent conflicts between the two. Um, and uh, you'll see this particularly revealed in the two views book we did with Biologos, uh, shows up in the four views book as well. And uh, then you've got the fusion model. And I think this is best represented uh, by the unsolicited manuscripts I receive. Uh, you know, as the president of reasons to believe, uh, our staff jokes at you know, at least once a week, uh, some person uh, sends me a manuscript that they want me to uh, read and endorse and some big thick manuscript. And uh, I've gotten to the point now where I don't read those uh, manuscripts. Uh, you know, it's one thing if I ask them to send me one, uh, but where it's unsolicited. But as I went through so many of these unsolicited manuscripts, there are typically people who are going through the Bible and thinking, every verse in the Bible has got scientific implications. And so they read into the Bible uh, a lot of science that frankly, I don't see there. I mean, uh, I don't get so many of these books now, uh, but I got books in the past uh, written by people who thought 
that uh, the entire panoply of uh, particle physics is revealed in scripture. So they'd be going through the Bible and actually flicking out all the different fundamental particles that are implied uh, in different texts in the Bible. Uh, and likewise, they would look at the record of nature and claim that everything within the record of nature has theological and philosophical implications. So I refer to this as the fusion model, uh, that they totally overlap and that everything in science uh, has implications philosophically and theologically and everything in the Bible has implications uh, scientifically. Now, a less extreme version of this is now referred to by uh, Christian theologians as hard concordism. The idea that there's a concordance between what the Bible reveals and we see in the record of nature, but the hard concordists are ones that can see, yeah, not every text in the Bible deals with science, uh, but most of the texts in the Bible deal with science. And likewise, not everything in the record of nature has philosophical and theological implications, but most of it does. And so again, I'm getting manuscripts where people are claiming these are all the texts that are talking about, uh, you know, dinosaurs. These are the texts that are talking about the bipedal primates that preceded humans. So they're reading into different texts about Homo erectus and the Neanderthals, for example. And uh, then the view that uh, we're endorsing that reasons to believe has been referred to by uh, theologians, particularly uh, in the Southern Baptist community, as soft concordism. Although a lot of people say we really prefer the term moderate concordism, which is the recognition uh, that there's not just a tiny amount of overlap between what the book of nature is saying and the book of scripture, but there's significant overlap. And yes, it doesn't amount to anything close to half the biblical content, uh, but there are significant texts. And so, for example, what we've been pointing out are reasons to believe there's over two dozen chapter length texts in the Bible that deal with creation and science. Uh, but hey, uh, that's just a tiny fraction of the total number of chapters in the Bible. And likewise, uh, we would recognize that there's a lot of uh, revelation coming through the book of nature that does have significant philosophical and theological implications. Now, often I ask, well, Hugh, can you put a percentage on it? I can't put a percentage on it. I mean, this is obviously an active area of research, um, but it's certainly nowhere near a half. Uh, in fact, uh, this di diagram here is exaggerated because I believe uh, it's less than 10%, uh, but it's more than 1%. So uh, somewhere within that range. And uh, I don't think we can put a hard number on it, uh, but I refer to it as a constructive uh, integration uh, in the sense that uh, it is possible to go through the book of nature and the book of scripture and actually find places where there is overlap, uh, where the book of nature can be used as a means to establish the credibility and authority of the book of scripture. And likewise, the book of scripture can be used because of the significant overlap as a means to establish uh, the authority and the reliability of the book of nature. And so the Bible, for example, is a powerful text uh, that counters the Gnostic view uh, that nothing revealed in nature uh, can be trusted as a revealing truth and nothing but uh, uh, truth. So how am I doing on time? Because I can't see a clock here. Or maybe you can't tell. Let, let me uh, stop the uh, share I'm feature. Right. Yeah, go uh, ahead. You're up about uh, t almost 10 after 11. Almost 10 after 11. Okay. Well, let me uh, just uh, finish with this uh, next slide here, is that uh, where we differ with the people that take the complementary view is they say, well, you know, we really do believe that God reveals himself in nature, but not in any way that could ever possibly uh, prove to be uh, a threat to anything that's in the Bible. I appreciate that their motive is uh, to ensure uh, that the reliability and trustworthiness and inerrancy of the Bible is protected. Uh, but I'm a little bit concerned they, they protect it by basically saying there's hardly any overlap uh, between the two books, and therefore it makes for an easier apologetic 
uh, you're not really called upon to bring much uh, scientific defense of what the Bible says. However, it does also have a consequence uh, that you can't use the book of nature as a tool to bring people uh, to the book of scripture. If there's very little overlap, then how can you uh, bring them uh, to the uh, uh, book of scripture? So it is an evangelistic uh, 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 deficit. And that's something we learned in uh, our many years of engagement and dialogue uh, with theistic evolutionists and evolutionary creationists. It seems to me their mission is to protect, protect the faith of Christians, whereas the mission we have at Reasons to Believe is to bring non-Christians, people who don't have a Bible background, who have not been raised in a Christian home, uh, to faith in uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, I also notice that uh, we have different testimonies. Uh, predominantly, they've been raised in Christian homes, and have gone to church as they were growing up, and predominantly, we had reasons to believe we're not raised in Christian homes and have adult conversions, uh, where we came to uh, Christ as adult rather than as a, a young child. And really, the issue is this. To what degree uh, does God's uh, creation uh, uh, reveal anything about the existence of God, the attributes of God, and can be used as a means uh, to test? And so our position is what we see in the record of nature uh, are evidences, scientific evidences for creation miracles, uh, for God operating outside of matter, energy, space, and time, operating in a way uh, that defies what naturalistic processes could possibly uh, hope to achieve. Uh, and, you know, it's a point I've made before is that uh, we actually need to get out in nature once in a while, actually see what's there, uh, just see how spectacularly beautiful it is, uh, to see uh, the intricacy of it all, how it all fits together, and uh, maybe we have the problem that too many of us live in large cities at this date. But I think, you know, people have always asked me, do you think these theistic evolutionists and evolutionary creationists you debate are Christians? And I say, yeah, I've gotten to know them. They re and, my, and my opinion is they really do have a relationship with Jesus Christ. However, they have a different motivation. They're motivated to protect the faith. And also I've noticed a lot of them this idea uh, that if you look at the Bible uh, in a literal way, the creation text in the Bible, the days are 24 hours, they're consecutive, and therefore they see an immediate conflict uh, with the scientific record. And then they back up and say, well, we just need to understand the Bible is not a science textbook. I agree it's not a science textbook, uh, but they take that to the point where they say, we don't think it's saying hardly anything about science at all. Well, I think it's about time for me to exit and I'll go to my meeting in Alabama. Uh, next week, I'll pick up that scientific discovery on uh, the scientific discovery on uh, uh, the fine structure constant, I actually tell you what it is, and then we'll get a little deeper into our lesson on the dual revelation. This is the reason why I'm speaking on dual revelation. I see this as a topic that I think is unnecessarily dividing believers. And it's also impacting our capacity uh, to bring people who have not been raised in a Christian context of faith in Christ. How are we ever gonna get people uh, to actually pick up the book of scripture if they don't see uh, God's revelation in some strong way uh, in the uh, book of nature? So we'll pick that up next time. I'm gonna stop the uh, share feature here and uh, turn it back over uh, to Mark and Jamie and Ross. And hey, you, I'm gonna, I'll take it over. And when, you're, uh, when you exit, I'll come in. Very good. I'm, we'll see all of you next week. Thank you. All right. Take care. Good morning, everyone. Hugh Ross is going to be here next week, and he'll be finishing the, the dual revelation. Or he'll have a full session. And we apologize the last two weeks he's had the contract with Alabama that came in at the last minute, but that's the way things go. So what we plan to do this week, uh, we had this last minute arrangement, and I thought I would go through something that would be consistent with his dual revelation theme. And that is recognizing that for the past probably about 400 years, 
the dual revelation theory or the dual revelation way of presenting the scriptures has gained more and more momentum and become more powerful. As you just mentioned, when we see science as being much more helpful in finding out how God, what God is like, the dual revelation becomes even more important. And so what I wanted to do is show one of the things that gives dual revelation the power that it has, notwithstanding the Holy Spirit, but there is an invention that we, I'd like to look at. And let me share screen here. And great, looks like we're here. All right. So the invention that, that I'm gonna be talking about is what I consider to be humanity's greatest invention. Now, depending on who you talk to, which historian you talk to, or which expert in technology you talk to, there are different ideas on what is humanity's greatest invention. Some people say the light bulb. Well, the light bulb is a pretty significant invention. Uh, you can't have the amount of work that's being done today occurring at 24 hour intervals con continuously without lighting and illumination. Other people have said, well, maybe it is the wheel. Transportation, and it really doesn't matter what form it is. You gotta have wheels on airplanes. You gotta have wheels on cars, you have wheels on trains. Uh, boats don't have any wheels on them though, but we still have wheel as a primary mode of um, transporting objects on land and moving them from land to the air and back again. So what about the wheel? Is that the world's greatest invention? Well, we can go on and on. I've looked for literally hours at the different theories on which is the most important invention. And the greatest inventions are confined to a group of about 10. But I'm like to discuss a couple here because they really tell us an idea of where we're gonna be heading here and what this has to do with dual revelation. So the first one is the idea of the printing press. Could we have the dual revelation that we have today as expounded as well without the printing press? It seems like it's a very important invention. And indeed it is, as I'll describe later on, um, what I think the world's greatest invention is, was in, in many respects facilitated by the pr printing press. But the printing press itself does not end up being the world's greatest invention. What about the city? The, if you talk to a civil engineer or you talk to many other historians, they'll argue that the greatest invention was the city because it is there where people congregated, were able to share information and were able to share resources in ways that they could not do with farms, for example, or with other rural areas. But the city was humanity's greatest invention because it allowed for things to happen that could never happen on a worldwide scale without cities. Well, that's very reasonable. Uh, I think that while we needed cities and while cities were invented, um, and, and become very, very useful, they're not humanity's greatest invention. And some have argued that the transistor is the world's greatest invention. And the reason that the transistor was considered the world's greatest invention by, by historians of various types, by the way, not just historians of technology, is that all of the instruments, for example, that we have right now, the, the computer that you're using to, to monitor this webinar, the computers that move the sequences of, of information between your computer and other computers, uh, GPS, your television, your radio, all these kinds of things rely on transistors. They're, they're small, small devices. And, and without them, you cannot get the rapid transmission of calculations occurring that occur in computers. You know, we did have things that could do the job of a transistor before, they were tubes. And so those of us who are over 60 remember tubes and television sets and radio sets that you would move up, pull them out and put them back in again when they were burned out. Uh, those were very energy intensive. They were slow. They were big compared to a transistor. And although they functioned very much like transistors, they were not nearly as sensitive and they were just catastrophically large. They were just 
not allowed the kind of advances in technology that we have today. So what about the transistor? Well, it's important, but it's not the most important. So what have I come up with a theory of, of what is humanity's greatest invention? By the way, it isn't just my theory, but it is, it is my theory that it, that it is humanity's greatest invention. And that greatest invention is arguably systemized knowledge. Systemized knowledge is knowledge that was originally unintentionally invented. It's an invention where it came about without anybody saying, I'm gonna plan to systematize knowledge and here's how we're gonna go about it. Unlike other inventions, it's socially invented. It was created by humanity at large rather than just by one or a collection of small collection of people. And I wrote in there that it's sine qua non. And what, what I mean by that is without it, you don't have anything. So just imagine, for example, that you don't have systemized knowledge, that knowledge couldn't propagate or couldn't be preserved, et cetera. How would you have civilization as we know it today? Uh, even the printing press would be useless. It could, could, you could make newspapers, things like that, but you, in order to make it really have the effect that it had, knowledge had to be systematized. And so what we mean by systemizing knowledge, I'm gonna talk about here, there are three pri primary characteristics of systemized knowledge. The first one is that we learned to categorize things. Now you can say, well, we've, we've been categorizing things for thousands of years. I mean, you can go into the book of Genesis. And when you look in the book of Genesis, what does it do? And very early on, the first couple of chapters, it's categorizing things according to things that live, things that are in the ocean, things that aren't alive, oceans versus land, etc. So things have been categorized forever, for as long as there have been people who've been writing about things. But something unique happened in the well, roughly around 1400s. And that was that the categorization became much, much more precise. And you'll see a couple of examples down below where you look at just two very, very big categories of the world, things that are alive and things that are not alive. And these categories have subcategories and categories below them and so forth. So you have life divided into animal and plant and microbe. And then the, the way that they're characterized with their physiology versus their behavior. And when you go into the world of physics, you look at non-life, micro, things that are subatomic, macro, things that are cosmic, things that are entire universe. And then the things that we would call behaviors or the interactions and then the objects that those interactions work on. The reason that categorization became so important was that as these discoveries got made, they had to put them in boxes and then compare the boxes, the categories, if you will, to, to refine them. And that refinement developed more categories and then arguments and disputes about the categories, which improved knowledge because people had to start asking questions they never asked before without arguing about categories. Stick with me here though. So there's another feature of the systemization of knowledge which is its propagation and preservation. So what are we talking about here? Well, knowledge before say the Gutenberg press, which was roughly 1450, 1440, somewhere around there, there was propagation of knowledge. People would transmit knowledge, you know, they'd go on travels and they would transmit their knowledge just accidentally as they would go to different places. So there was a transmission of knowledge, but it wasn't systematic and it wasn't well-preserved. As a matter of fact, there were some libraries throughout the antiquities, but the libraries tended to be, have, have one thing in common. They tended to be private preserves so that somebody in one part of the world wouldn't have access to that library, A, because it was so far away, and B, because the person who owned that library was generally a king or somebody like that, and they wouldn't get access to it because the king wouldn't let them. So, even though there were storehouses of knowledge, what I would call um, knowledge preserves, uh, they weren't accessible. So one of the things that happened was that it would, took so much time to write a document and then so much time to reproduce it 
that the knowledge that was acquired and the categories that started to develop were so slow and so incompetent in propagation that the world didn't move very much in that respect. But the, there was no real systemization of knowledge. But then comes along the Gutenberg Press, which we talked about earlier. In the Gutenberg Press, what happened was we were able to, to produce documents and books cheaply, quickly. And then when we started to use the, the theory of categorization, finding out where we were going, how we we're going to distribute these things. And what were the topics that were going to be discussed in the things that were produced? This naturally led to large preserves of knowledge. And knowledge spread very quickly and systematically. And interestingly, part of the systematization of the knowledge came because it was they needed distribution networks. They needed to figure out where do we want to send our books? Who's going to buy them? Who had commercial interests? So it was kind of an interesting accident that knowledge became systemized because of commerce. And then once those became established, then what was gonna happen next? Well, it wasn't until around the 18th century that we had public libraries. So we still had a lot of books being produced. Um, more people had access to them. The categories of information that were out there were broadened, were, were uh, more tightly classified, were debated more frequently. And as a result, became much more effective. Knowledge became more systemized because the categories were more effective and because the knowledge that was developed was propagated faster because books, magazines, um, journals, et cetera, were produced. And then in the 18th century, when, when public libraries began to pop up, and by the way, the, some of the very first public libraries were churches. They bought up collections of works and then opened them to the public. This Christianity did a great job with that. But there were other places, particularly in England, where um, cities would buy libraries and open them to the public. And what that did was it made knowledge a public access event. Everyone could get access to knowledge. Anyone who could read or anyone who could be read to could go to a library, grab a book, grab a magazine, grab a periodical, Boom, you have this sudden diffusion of knowledge that's systematized by the way it's distributed and by the way it's written, the categories that it's in. Mark? Yes, you, please. You're not sharing your screen, did you know? What's that? You're not sharing your screen, did you know? You're, I think your slides are not being shown. Okay, well, let me, let me do something here. How about now? No, still not. Okay. Let you have me... to select it and then there's a share button at the bottom once you select your the screen that you want. All right, hang on with me for just a second. Okay, let me get out of this for just a second. I have to find out where my, my PowerPoint went. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Let me uh, get my slideshow back here. Just don't, didn't know if you meant to do that. I did not know, and I'm glad you told me. Okay, I hit the share screen. Now, is it showing up? No. You hit share screen, 
you, you select it and then hit the blue button, there should be a blue button say share at the bottom. Once you select the screen. There you go. But we see one of your screens. Okay, I think I figured out what's going on here. There's your screen. There you go. Okay, so let me, yeah. my apologies to everybody for this mix up here. So let me get us to where we are now. So we were we just got through talking about the preservation and propagation of knowledge systematically. And we talked about the, the Gutenberg Press and the transfusion of knowledge that way in public libraries. Magazines and journals also help preserve and propagate the knowledge. <clears throat> there was something else that happened. And of these three things, the, the creation of knowledge juries, um, that, that you don't hear that term very often, but a knowledge jury is a, a group of people who evaluate the, the knowledge that's been propagated. So the, probably the most significant knowledge jury that we use today is called a peer review journal. And a peer review journal is a, is a collection of articles written by people who are experts in a particular field and whose articles are judged by other experts in the same field. And those experts in the same field, they're jurors, so to speak, the editors who evaluate those papers. When they get looked at, they determine several things. Number one, is the knowledge that's being presented valuable? The first thing, if it's not, then it's irrelevant and they discard it. The next one is, is it true? Or if, it's, if they don't know whether it's true, is it worth debating? So knowledge juries through peer reviewed journals were extremely important in creating what we have now as systemized knowledge in a way that we never had it before. Now, some people could say, well, there were, there were, there were journals, peer-reviewed journals, all the way back in the Newton's time, back in the 12th century, which is true, but nothing like what we have today. And uh, even though some of the peer-reviewed journals today are edited politically, most of them are not. They're, they're edited professionally, unlike in the 12th century when it was very political and you could only get in if get your stuff published if you knew somebody. So open journals are the next feature, uh, the, the, the another kind of knowledge jury. We have journals that are merely out there to, to posit different kinds of viewpoints that are allowed to compete with each other. So you'll have an article saying black holes have a certain diameter with a certain mass. And another article saying black holes have a, a diameter that's different from that. And so they go back and forth. So they have this basically this discursive mode about them. And, and so the juries ended up being the people who are reading them because they were the ones who put in new articles and determine how the truth is evaluated. The modern blogosphere blogs are is probably the weakest form. And I would I almost didn't put it in there because the problem with the blogs is even though people can comment on them, um, they can be rapacious, uh, they can be really nasty, and they don't really foment uh, anything but nastiness, although some do perpetuate knowledge. So let's just stick with peer review journals and open journals, with peer review journals being the number one form of knowledge jury. Uh, so were there demands on the systemized knowledge? Now you have knowledge that is not only um, being evaluated for its truth, that it's being well propagated, and that's creating categories that are interesting and useful. But people started to say, well, now that we have this, uh, we, we wanna make some demands on this. Well, the, the knowledge that's coming out of here that's fruitful is first of all, um, we wanna accurately describe or characterize reality of this knowledge. That, that's probably the most important feature of systemized knowledge is the demand that it accurately describe or characterize reality. The next thing is that it was supposed to predict phenomena. In other words, when people got this knowledge, they wanted to be able to use it to make predictions. How can I make my crops improve next season? How can I make this engine work better? How can I do whatever? How will this work, these predictions? So prediction became something that was a demand placed 
on this kind of knowledge. And then the next was that it would explain phenomena. Why does it rain? Why does it not rain? Why does it snow instead of rain? On why, why is there water in the ocean? Those kinds of things were your fundamental questions. Why do stars do what they do? Why do plants do what they do? People demanded explanations with this knowledge. And so it contributed to the value of the knowledge, but it had to submit to this as, as a demand. And then the last one is it had to inspire or direct fruitful research. And what we mean by that is that getting knowledge alone isn't enough, even if it's well categorized, even if it's being well propagated, even if it's being well preserved and, and well um, curated. But you have to have something to do with it. And so what it did was it, there came this demand for what we now know as research and research on organized scales and large scales, even small scales, but very, very technically adroit. And so one of the things that was demanded of this knowledge is that we create these kinds of fruitfully research, fruitful research organizations like schools and laboratories, which flourished and increased our knowledge even more. So what's, what's next? And we have these demands on knowledge, on the systemized knowledge. Notice that I'm not just talking about knowledge in general. General knowledge is, is not what I want to get to here. And the reason is that general knowledge doesn't categorize things. It doesn't make things, um, doesn't propagate itself systematically, and it doesn't have knowledge juries. But it's still useful. We still need to know how to ride a bicycle. So what happens now? Well, now you see this emergence of something that we today now call science. And this didn't really start happening until about 400 years ago. Around the time of the Gutenberg press, a lot of things happened together. You started having, once this Gutenberg press was able to create books and people were able to connect things together, science grew in a way that it never grew before. Some would argue that science began around the 14 or 1500s. Um, there's a very good argument for that, depending on how you want to define science. But what we will do is we're going to look at some of the things that, that do characterize science and see how systemized knowledge drove it. And modern science is systemized knowledge, but it has a few more features to it. So what we're going to do next is we're going to look at the, the features of systemized knowledge and then how they connect to science. So if modern science is systemized knowledge with a few more features, what are those features? Well, let's start out by comparing the two. We have science on the right side, knowledge on the left side. Um, knowledge does the things that we talked about earlier. It categorizes, it preserves and propagates knowledge, it creates knowledge juries to curate it and make sure we get the truth. And then you have in the, in the left, lower left, you see these red texts. The red texts are interestingly, the consequences and the demands of systemized knowledge, but they're also exactly the things that science does. So what happened was some of the demands on systemized knowledge became the very features that characterize science. Can you imagine science that doesn't accurately describe or characterize reality? You can't. Science wouldn't exist if it didn't do that. Can you imagine science if part of it at least didn't predict phenomena? You can't. It's, it's absolutely part of what we call science. The same thing was explaining phenomena and the same thing with, with directing and creating fruitful research. If any of those four or five, six or seven in the, in the red text didn't flow from the, the systemized knowledge, we would not have science as we have it today. But science cultivated itself. And when it became more and more tightly cultivated, it created a set of six assumptions. They had to have these assumptions because if they didn't have them, they wouldn't, science wouldn't work the way it does. The first one is that nature is orderly. It's consistent. You can rely on it. That if, if something happens one way in one part of the universe, it's going to happen similarly somewhere else. Uh, you don't expect it, for example, that if you go to Japan, and you're at sea level and you're holding a ball in your front yard and you drop the ball that suddenly it's gonna go up instead of down. 
It doesn't matter where you are on Earth, it's going to do the same thing. And so that's what we're talking about when we talk about science, assuming a certain orderliness to it, that there are some things you can rely on, and those things are the order of the universe. The next one is that nature is intelligible, and this is really important. And, and before I do that, let me mention that um, the orderliness of the universe is something that's mentioned in the Bible. And if you, if you look at throughout the Bible, it describes the universe in ways that assume its orderliness, that when God created the universe, he created it in a way that would be predictable and that we could rely on. And the same thing with B, where it talks about the intelligibility. The Bible also talks about that, particularly if you go to Romans 1, 19 and 20, where the Bible says, we're held accountable to know God's eternal nature and his, and his power by looking at creation. That we can interpret from creation some of the most fundamental things in the universe, particularly the most important one, the existence and power and eternal nature of God. Science can't function without that either. One of the things that science does is it assumes that natural phenomena have natural causes. You can't, science can't work without that. And that assumption is not in some other domains. So for example, literature doesn't rely on that. Um, some forms of philosophy don't rely on that. Science absolutely has to have that as a fundamental assumption. Why? Because if you assume that the universe is orderly and you assume that it's intelligible, that we can understand it and we can derive laws or derive um, rules or law-like statements about its regularities, then we're going to be looking for those natural causes for those natural effects. It assumes science also assumes that logic and the rules of inference are reliable. We can't, we cannot deduce things from arguments from science or induce things from observations of science without adhering to rules of inference. If we vary from those rules of inference, everything breaks down. Science literally becomes an irrational operation. We have to have logic and believe that it's reliable. So it's an assumption. The next one is that the universe exists independent of our perceptions. This too is something that's, that isn't shared all over. So there are philosophies, for example, and religions that don't believe the universe exists independent of our perceptions. There are people who believe that, well, the universe is characterized and it's actually produced by what we perceive. Um, science does not see it that way. And the reason it doesn't is that the experiments wouldn't make any sense if there wasn't a universe independent of our own personal perceptions. There has to be a real there out there. Which leads us to the last one that we have to assume that our physical senses are generally reliable. We all know that we can be fooled and have optical illusions or or aural illusions or all sorts of illusions that our senses can be duped. We can be fooled, we can be tricked. But generally speaking, we go by our daily life relying on our senses. And scientists realize that. Scientists realize that if they look at an instrument, their eyes are not lying to them when they look at the dial, that they can really rely on their eyes. And they, do, they know that because everybody else who talks to them is relying on their eyes and say the same thing. So the, the assumption that our physical senses are generally reliable is a fundamental assumption of science. So you see these six assumptions, they are unique to science. They don't have to be in some other domains of knowledge. And the systemized knowledge that we talked about and on the left side there, the categorization, et cetera, that led to those last four things there, the um, descriptions and predictions, et cetera, which science fundamentally must rely on and produce are all put together in what I would call this, this brilliant, invention of humanity, of systemized knowledge. And science is its pinnacle. Now the two books model became more powerful with the systemized knowledge and with science. And I would argue that it's the greatest invention of systemized knowledge is a gift from God. And it's one that people don't even talk about or ever think about. Because how many people, how many people do you know who've thought about the fact that we do categorization in ways that, that wasn't done 
thousands or hundreds of years ago. How many people think about the way that knowledge is systemized and propagated change the way we view scripture? Because now we have theologians that can communicate and describe things about history and about the knowledge of the past and ways of interpreting the Bible that they couldn't do thousands of years ago. And so modern science emerged from this, from the systemized knowledge, and it makes more precise and fundamental knowledge about God possible. We've never in the history of the world, never in the history before systemized knowledge, been able to give such clear, powerful arguments from nature for the existence of God, for the way he operates, for some of the things that he do does. We're still struggling with trying to figure out what kind of a God is it that allows carnivory? What kind of a God is it that allows these uncertainties in the quantum level? What kind of a God is it that takes millions and billions of years to do these things? Well, there's a lot of things you can infer, but you don't even start asking those questions until you know those facts. So the last thing is that the book of nature helps us to understand the book of scripture, just as the book of scripture helps us to understand the book of nature. They both benefit from systemized knowledge. And the systemized knowledge is something that I would, I would want to tell everybody that we should thank God for it. And we should also think about it every once in a while that the knowledge we have, as systematic as it is, isn't an accident. And it's also something that's very real. It's a very real technology and it was a very real invention. And it's something that God has given us and we have to honor him and thank him for it. So with that, I know that there's some Q&A or if there isn't, I'll just sign us off. Um, Ross, do we have any questions that need to get answered? Does anybody have any questions for me? Yeah, Mark. Um there's no questions in Q&A, but I have a couple for you. Please. Um, preceding systemized knowledge would be the ability for us to communicate in written form and having language. Uh, because of that, could we say that language is an even greater invention than systemized knowledge? Uh, you know, I wouldn't, I could, I couldn't, no, I wouldn't say that. And the reason I would not yeah. say that is that language is intrinsic to the human nature. So the very first human being that was created came factory equipped with the ability to communicate with God. And so it wasn't an invention. And, and so language is intrinsic to, to the human mind. And we can even see that in babies. I mean, when you look at the studies on babies, babies acquire language without having to invent it. And they're able to produce more in the language that they utter, then they derive from the things that they hear, which is a very, very interesting fact about human knowledge and human language. So my, my long answer to that question is no, I think language is not an invention. It's an attribute of humanity. Was that responsive to your question? Yes, thank you. Um, Keith Wilson has a question. He says, where does the invention of writing feature since it was prior to systemized knowledge? I guess that's the same question I just asked. No, I think you asked about language and he was asking about writing. So language can be oral, and but writing is exclusively written and physical. So so who was who asked that question? Keith Wilson. Keith, Keith, thank you for that question. The, the invention of lang or written language or, or writing and, and the symbols um, it's extremely important. And you're right, you could not have systemized knowledge without that. But you could have writing and you did have writing and we did have lots of ways of, of putting writing down in print without systemized knowledge. So systemized knowledge, you have to have writing, but writing doesn't necessarily generate systemized knowledge. And as a matter of fact, it didn't for thousands of years because there was writing for at least 3,000 years that I know of. And, and oddly enough, there were printing presses that go back to uh, 2,000 years. And in China, there was moving type, moving type printing presses, not anywhere near as sophisticated as Gutenberg Press around the year 1,000 and 1,020 or so that 
it came out, actually came out of Korea. So the answer to the question is, yes, I believe it's, it's absolutely essential to systemize knowledge to have writing and written symbolic forms of communication. But I don't think that we could say that that is the greatest invention because you could have writing and still not have systemized knowledge. Thank you very much, Keith. That was a fantastic, insightful question. And you could argue against my point, by the way. Uh, Norm Helgeson has a really good question. He says, isn't this capability to systemize knowledge a characteristic of man rather than an invention of man, a gift of God as he created us? Yes, I would say he's right in both respects. Number one, uh, we are uniquely endowed with the ability to do the three systemized knowledge is characterized by. So one of them is to, to put things in categories. Animals do that. The next thing is to propagate the knowledge in systematic ways. Animals don't do that. And the next thing is to have, <laughs> animals don't have them. So when humanity got to a point where they recognized the need for categories and started to categorize things, all of these different features came together as an invention a, a cumulative invention that today actually there's there are studies called systemized knowledge studies that um, have refined it to a point where you can see it as its own science but it's a, it's an invention but but norm's absolutely right that it's a gift of god and i'm glad he brought that up because that was a point i really want to emphasize is that the the our capacity to do that is uniquely human is uniquely endowed by God. And by the way, who do you think has the greatest systemized knowledge in the universe? <laughs> the same God who created us has systemized knowledge and allowed us to acquire it. Thank you, Norm. Would you say then, Mark, that our ability to do to produce systemized knowledge is part of what Genesis talks about when it says that we're created in his image? Ross, I had not thought of that, but I think you're absolutely right. I think it does. What is it that when you hear, when you come up with that idea, what triggers that in your mind? Huh, boy. Uh, uh, wow. I I don't know how I came up with that. It was just. <laughs> it was okay. Just it's just a, it's yeah. a stroke of genius. Yeah. Well, that's, that's par for the course. That's good for you. Yeah, but it yeah, sure I makes think, sense. I think you're right. It makes sense to me that that would be part of that, that would be part of it. Yeah, thank you. Um, Doug McComb has a question. He says, "How are human instincts explained to exist if not from God? How are animal instincts explained? A baby horse instantly knows how to walk, as do giraffes instantly when they are born." Uh, I don't think you can explain them apart from God. Uh, evolution theorists would say that. Uh, from the last universal common ancestor microbe that complexity developed and that these instincts instincts developed along with them. Now, there is no absolutely zero explanation for that. Zero, because instinctual behavior is not just chemical behavior. Instinctual behavior is moderated by chemical behavior, but it's not entirely chemical behavior. So uh, Doug is absolutely right. Um, everything from the, the human infant's uh, instinct to suckle his mother's breast to the, you know, the, the tiger's desire and, and instinct to go out and hunt for prey, all of those were divinely provided. And if you look in the book of Job, God even says as much. He says, did I not give prey to the lion? Yeah. You know, he's, he not only gives prey, but the, the, it, you get the prey-predator relationship is instinctual and it comes from God. And the only way that God would do that is to create the instinct to begin with. Very good. Thank you, Mark. This has been great. Uh, Karina has a good question. She says, how can we improve the educational system today, especially at the early stages where it seems to be more focused on memorization and grades than in teaching students to analyze and interpret data? If, if I had the class of my dreams, and I did for a while when I homeschooled my children a couple of years, 
one of the things I would do is I would recognize that there are some things I just have to know by rote. So you got to learn your, your times tables. You got to learn the alphabet. You have to learn how to write, et cetera. But once you get past that, then you have to start asking questions like, how do you know this? So you, uh, you, you create a, an education system that allows people to ask questions that the rote memorization scheme doesn't ask. So for example, um, I remember when I was in school, we had our science textbooks and I would ask the, the teacher, well, how does that happen? And she would say, well, I don't know. <laughs> how do we find out? And so the, the, the questions that arose in the minds of the children went unanswered. And I think that probably the best way to go about that is to give them ways of finding answers on their own and then letting them go with their own curiosities because they will find amazing things. And nowadays with the internet, they can find all sorts of stuff. So the next feature of this would be critical thinking. And that is to, to, to inquire of, of the students, not only how do they know something, but what is it that makes them believe it? So what would it cause them to believe something differently, for example? Um, a lot of people come to ideas and they substitute their emotions for facts. Well, the only way to undermine that is to say, how do you come to know this? How do you come to believe that? So there are probably a million other ways of doing it, Karina. Um, I'd love to think about this for a while and, and talk more about it, maybe we will. But that's as close as I can get right now. I imagine there are other people who are watching this right now have some great suggestions. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to ask this question as my last question because I have to leave right at noon and then Jamie's going to take over. This has really provoked a lot of uh, wonderful questions and I, I want to say thank you for putting all this together in three or four days. It's uh, remarkable what you've done. Um, you. Wilson says the Bible is systemized knowledge. So did it begin properly with the writing in the Bible? Okay, say that question one more time. I, I'm going to paraphrase it because I think I know what he's asking. The Bible is systemized knowledge. So did systemized knowledge begin with the writing in the Bible? No, I don't think the Bible is systemized knowledge. I think the propagation of the Bible became part of systemized knowledge, but the Bible itself is not systemized knowledge. We know we, we have what's called a systematic theology. Um, but remember, the systematic theology is um, meta-discursive. In other words, it's a discussion about another discussion. So you have the 66 books of the Bible, each of which was written at a different time. Um, the, you don't systemize them and collect them until much later. Even the Old Testament was done in, in segments and pieces. And so we systemize what we learn from the Bible, but the Bible itself is not systemized knowledge. Uh, not the way we've described it in, in today's webinar. Jamie, were there any other questions? I see a lot of chats, but I don't see any questions. Sorry, looking for the mute button. Um, Good job, mute now. <laughs> so uh, Mark Durham asks, back on the written, Back on the written language, the Peruvian Inca used not tying and as writing. Is this on the same level of actual written symbols? They use what? Uh, not tying as writing. Not time? I, yes. Well, any right. kind of anything that's presented to the senses to convey information would be considered a language. So <clears throat> whether using um, sound, like uh, a, a verbal utterance, something used by your mouth, or you tap something, I mean, you tap Morse code, is that not a language? Um, you could play tones on a particular instrument and convey things, as long as the, the sender and the receiver both understand what the message is in the code, then it's a language. So I'm not sure what that particular language was or what that particular um, mode of transmission was, but if it, if it was something that was presented to the senses 
by a sender and a receiver, it's by definition a language. Any other questions? We have one from Johnny. Uh, he asks, do you think it reasonable that we could fashion fioms of systemized, what should we say in, fioms of systemized knowledge that function as lingua franca, as it were, that this would allow us to decouple our languages and cultures from the basic truths themselves? No, I don't think so. And the reason I don't think so is not that we couldn't get a lingua franca, a lingua franca being a common language for everybody, but the, the systemization of knowledge um, occurs because there are groups who want particular kinds of knowledge. Remember early on, I talked about categorization of knowledge. Um, the categories now are boundless. There are so many types and the number of our numbers of them are, are increasing. And they're also being more tightly refined and disputed. And because of that, there will always be new kinds of disputes over categories, which is going to create new research. And you will never be able to, to decouple systemized knowledge from anything. Because as long as you have people who are doing the three things that you have in systemized knowledge, propagating knowledge, preserving knowledge, um, adjudicating knowledge and determining whether it's true, and, and then um, making sure that you have categories that are in dispute or are, are helping fruitful research, you're gonna to continue to improve the systemization of knowledge. Now, there is one thing that I would say though, one thing can erode the systemization of knowledge is when you create, when you take apart any one of those. And I think the one thing that's starting to come apart is the knowledge juries. So once you create a, a, an internet where people can discuss things without them being tested, you're starting to decouple knowledge juries from the knowledge. Now that's, that's for popular knowledge. And remember early on, I distinguished general knowledge from um, systemized knowledge. Systemized knowledge, I think is going to continue and going to get better and better and more and more effective. And thank God, more and more effective in helping us show the gospel of Jesus Christ through the creation and show that God's the one who created everything and how powerful and intelligent and wise and beautiful and loving he is. But I don't think we'll ever decouple systemized knowledge from anything as long as there are people who demand to know the truth. And that number still is increasing and we still need it for science. Thank you for that question, that was a great one. Any others? Yes. Um, Esther McCorkle from uh, uh, McCorkle Hollis from Ohio. Uh, I remember. Yes, right. Um, she has system system Systemized knowledge question that Ross asked was exactly what I thought um, Thought at the same time. God's character is also knowable, except that he gives us the ability to learn about his systemized knowledge by our ability to use systemized knowledge. Sorry, that's a comment. <laughs> yeah, but that's an important one. And I'm glad she said that because it reiterates exactly the theme of my talk, which is it's God who gave it to us. And, and God who we should give back to by using what he gave us to present the world, these two, these two magnificent books, the book of nature and the book of scripture and systemized knowledge works to preserve and to present both of them. Great, great. Is that it? Are we done with the questions? Oh, no, we have some more. Susan, um, uh, Susan Lambo, Lambo. Sorry, um, she asks, in theories of divine simplicity, cannot, God cannot be omniscient and learn new things. Do you think God learns? No, he doesn't learn. And, and I understand the, the notion of divine simplicity. He can't be divided into other things. Uh, no, God doesn't learn. He knows everything to begin with. He's known everything from before there was time. 
So no, God doesn't learn. Sometimes the Bible makes it look like he learns. Sometimes it makes it look like he changes his mind. But those are, are constructions of language used specifically to describe conditions of human nature. And so that from it's done from a human perspective. It's sometimes called anthrop anthropopathy, anthro anthropopathy, you know, to 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 present um, God as if he were a, a human, not just anthropomorphism, but to present his I, his feelings as if he had human feelings and, and human restraints. Uh, he doesn't. He doesn't learn. But sometimes the Bible makes it look like he does because that's how the people at the time wrote their their scriptures and understood God as doing something different in response, or apparently different, in response to something done by a human. Okay, thank you. Uh, Norm Hegelson, Helgeson, oh, sorry, I said it wrong. Um, Norm asks, so what is the invention that fundamentally helped us most to widely teach and effectively systematize knowledge? Is there anything more important than the printing press? Uh, I'm not sure that there's anything more important than the printing press um, in the beginning, but remember that this is a that systemized knowledge is a technology. It's an intellectual technology. Uh, you can't IP it. You can't get a, a trademark for it or a copyright for it. But it actually is uh, an intellectual entity. Uh, you you can call it whatever else you want to call it, but uh, it is an invention just like some other technologies that were entirely intellectual were invented. Theories, certain theories that are, were in later patented. Uh, you can't patent this. I think that the, the, the printing press probably helped systemize knowledge more than anything else for the first couple of hundred years. But once you got public libraries, that dramatically changed things because it became Systemized knowledge became publicly accessible to people who'd never been able to have it before. We can't, of course, you can't have public libraries without printing presses for the books. So I think Norm's point is well taken, that the, the printing press was crucial to the production of systemized knowledge, but you could have the printing press and never have systemized knowledge. There was more to it than just the printing press. Okay, thank you. Um, Doug McComb asks, what is super empirical knowledge? Super empirical knowledge? I don't know what, what he means by super empirical knowledge. Um, I, I, the only thing I can think of, and I'm, I'm just inventing this because I don't know, I've never heard of super empirical knowledge, uh, would be knowledge that would, would control what is known empirically. So for example, um, a theory could be super empirical knowledge because the, the theory itself is knowledge about how the things that are empirical operate. But I don't know, that's just what I would, if I were gonna use the term super empirical, that's how I would use it. But I do not know that as a term of art. So Doug, you got me on that one. I've never heard of that before. Stump the trunk. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right. Doug has one, one more minute or so, and or maybe a question or two, and then we'll be done. Okay. So um, the question would be Do you reject some of the tenets of open theism? Um, and, and why? Do you... Yes. If, if open theism is the, is the notion that as, as, history progresses, God learns and becomes different. I totally reject that. Absolutely reject it. And the Bible says that's not true too. So I'm not an open theist. And, and so if, if open theism is that God learns through history, no, I, I, I absolutely disagree with that. Okay. That's our last question, Mark. Okay. Well, let me, let me say thank you to everybody who had the patience to put up with me screwing up the uh, slides. Too bad you didn't see the first ones. They were pretty neat. But anyway, I hope the most important point is that 
we see God as, a, as the giver of systemized knowledge. And that when we look at the two books of nature, we think about systemized knowledge and what a gift it is for us. And I'm going to pray for us right now and, and send us on our way. So Lord, thank you for these people who have spent the time to, to learn about you. May they see you as the precious God you are. Help us, Lord, to bring people to you through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. And we'll bless you, Lord, for all the good things that come. Bless <laughs> you all people all week. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week.